Welcome back, everybody, to the Law and Crime Trial Network. I'm Rachel Stockman, in for Jesse Weber, alongside legal analyst Terry Austin. Thanks for joining me. And we're live back inside that case in Tennessee against Eric Boyd. It looks like a police officer has taken the stand. We were just hearing from a member of the uh, Marshall unit who had been part of the task force arresting some of the defendants. Now it looks like a police officer is just introducing herself. Let's listen in. Well, they're just flying through witnesses in the trial against Eric Boyd. That was a police officer. Did you get the gist of what she was talking about? She was involved in his arrest, took his clothes? Yeah. What was the point of that? <laughs> that was very, very short, and it didn't really establish anything. I will say that the prior witness established a couple of minor points, the first being that the Boyd defendant was being very cooperative. Mm -hmm. And he showed during cross. That yes, came during out. cross. Yes. That's exactly right. I think that the cross brought out a couple of good points. But this witness wasn't even cross examined, and I don't think on direct had very much evidence to show the jury, really. Does that matter, though, that, I mean, does that help his case that he was cooperative at first with investigators? I think it does. I mean, I think the jury is going to add up all of this evidence. Was there DNA evidence? And, you know, was he cooperative? And they're going to think to themselves that maybe he wasn't part and parcel of the whole horrible events that occurred. Especially if he was so quick to just turn over somebody. Maybe he wasn't as involved as the police and prosecutors are now making him out to be. Okay, it looks like we have another witness on the stand. Not sure who she is, but we will soon find out. Let's listen in. Okay, this is a former ATF agent. Agent, and he was on the hunt, it seems, at the time for some of these co-defendants in this case, Terry Austin. But we were just discussing, you know, as a juror, acting like we hate, don't know this case at all, we're finding how the prosecution's presenting the witnesses a bit out of order to be a bit confusing. For instance, we have this woman who's talking about the chain of custody for Boyd's clothes. Then all of a sudden, so I think maybe we're going to get testimony about the DNA or something and then all of a sudden this guy comes on talking about arresting them so I don't get how it's all working together yet and just imagine Rachel if we're not following you know the jury is not following and a good prosecutor is going to take the case go in order establish the chain of custody and do it one by one and not go back and forth. So now this witness is talking about someone's girlfriend and what does that oh, have to do? She led them to some of the defend co-defendants. And again, you know, sometimes it becomes a matter of some of these witnesses, maybe they're not available. Um, you know, when you have to go on the order, you have to go. But it, especially when you have these short witnesses just giving one little teeny part of the piece and you kind of want to see the full picture, it gets very confusing. I couldn't agree more. And hopefully during the closing, which is some time away, <laughs> but hopefully during the closing, the prosecution is going to put this all together for the jury. And that's the prosecution's job, certainly. Okay, so we're going to take a quick break. When we return, we'll take you back inside the case against Eric Boyd. Stay with us here on Law and Crime. Okay, that former ATF investigator talking about first the arrest of several of the defendants, then talking about going back into the home where they were arrested, and apparently several of them were residing, talking about the various things he found in the home, and that they showed a picture of a gun there. It's not clear at this point if that gun was related to the crime, but I'm assuming that will be the case. I think you're exactly right. I'm assuming that that gun had something to do with the crime. He said that he looked around, he found a pocketbook, and there was evidence in the pocketbook that led back to the crime. He didn't say exactly what was in there, but what he's trying to do is piece it all together and make it clear that they were at the crime, then they all went to this house that was owned by this woman, Hayes, they all stayed together there, and there's evidence of the crime in that house. Inside that house. Okay, we're going to get in a quick break as he continues to go through evidence. We'll be listening carefully, take you back to Tennessee in just a few minutes. Stay with us. Okay, some interesting cross-examination of this former ATF agent, uh, uh, current ATF agent at the time. What did you get out of it? I think that the cross-examination was pretty good. There were just two minor points. Why were there three subpoenas for the search? And also the most important point here is that Boyd was not incriminated in any way, shape, or form. And that's a very good point for the defense. During the first interview with Vanessa Coleman that he sat in, so that is interesting that later on he does get incriminated years after this happened. Okay, we have to take a quick break. We'll be back in just a few minutes. The Eric Boyd trial is on a recess about 15 minutes as soon as it's live. We'll take you back there. 
In the meantime, though, let's play some testimony from yesterday. Interesting from a residential driver for Waste Connections. Uh, he's an important, important witness in this case because he was there on the block of the Shipman House when the alleged murders happened. And he testifies to the fact that he noticed some very suspicious activity. Take a listen. We're listening to Xavier Jenkins, and in a way, he is a crucial witness in all of this, not involved at all. But he says he saw the forerunner and four people inside the vehicle the night that these murders occurred. He seems to have a very good memory, Terry Austin. He had an excellent memory, and he was very cooperative, and the police officer showed him a lineup of the cars, six pictures, and he very clearly identified the one he saw with the pinstripe. So I think he's being a good, you know, witness for uh, the prosecution here. And why is it so crucial that the police are able to put that vehicle in the driveway at the house that night? It's crucial because it's showing that these four men were there in the vehicle, he identified the four men. And you know, these cars that were at the house, one was the cars of the deceased now. And so that's why it's important to show that these men were carjacking. Absolutely, okay, let's uh, continue to listen. There's one of the vehicles you just saw there on your screen, but let's continue to listen to more of his testimony. Wow, so that was getting a little confrontational there with the attorney. Uh, him really saying he adamantly, if he had his choice, wouldn't want to be involved in this whatsoever. He doesn't want to watch the coverage. I, I mean, I don't really get the point of why that all occurred, though. I mean, do you understand? Rachel, you are hitting it on the head once again. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I don't know why under cross-examination here the defense would want to talk about did you see coverage of this? Because when it occurred, this witness actually identified the car. So whether or not he saw coverage years later doesn't really make a difference. He was right on point when this event occurred and he identified the forerunner with this pinstripe. I mean, I guess the defense is trying to say, well, you were watching coverage, so maybe you got affected by it. Maybe that was the point of where he was going with the cross-examination, but instead it got a little hostile between the two of them. Yes, that was the point, but what I think is, as long as this witness was clear at the time, the media coverage really doesn't make any difference. And if anything, I think the cross-examination helped um, the strength of this witness, I think he seemed very believable saying, I wanted nothing to do with this case. I'm not here to become famous. I'm not here. He seemed legitimate and, and, and the jurors probably are saying, well, why wouldn't we believe him then? That's exactly right. I think he was very convincing when he was telling the attorney, I don't want to be here. I don't want to hear my name on the radio. And yet here I am doing what's asked of me. Exactly. Terry Austin, you're great. Thank you for being with me this morning. Terry's going to stay with me a little bit longer. We're going to take a quick break here on the Law and Crime Network. The trial is also on break. When we return, we'll take a deeper dive into a trial that's going on out of California involving the alleged Hollywood Ripper. Stay with us.